I welcome all the participants and our dear panelists uh, to our first uh, Nadima panel in this year, 2022, with distinguished uh, speakers from Iran and our dear our discussions from Germany, uh, who would be moderated by Dr. Shavar from a Strong Motion Network. My name is Mohammad Reza Farzanegan. I am from University of Marburg at the Center of Near Middle East Studies. And uh, uh, basically this panel is a part of our the other project with, uh, uh, with, uh, with Iranian partners and German universities. In Iran, uh, University of Tehran and the Strong Motion Network are partners. And in Germany, uh, University of uh, Applied Science T. Hakol and the uh, University of Freiburg. They are collaborating in this project. It's about natural disaster management. And uh, we have started this project since 2020. And this is the third and the last year of this project. Uh, due to the corona situation, as uh, you are aware, uh, we shifted to a series of online workshops and panel discussion. We hope that this year, of course, we finally managed to organize some physical events in Iran and in Marburg. But for the moment, uh, we continue uh, a couple of online panel discussions, which basically are supposed to deal with different aspects of natural disaster management. Uh, Dr. Shaba is from a Strong Motion Network and moderate decisions. And I would like to invite him to uh, continue um, uh, and introduce the of today. Uh, and again, uh, I would like to thank all the participants and the colleagues who facilitated organization of this panel and cooperated with us to organize this one on this important topic, not only for Iran, but also for Germany, uh, which is also experiencing some forms of disaster. Uh, Dr. Shava, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. President. Yesterday, uh, our seminar uh, title is about application of disaster loss of in disaster risk management, DRM. Uh, we have two parts. Uh, the first part is about uh, post disaster risk assessment, PDNA in Iran, uh, which is lectured by Dr. Kamal Amin Hosseini from IAS. Uh, the first movement uh, is made by the family uh, started with introducing a summary about the importance of PDNA and the experience uh, <coughs> during the <coughs> uh, in Iran Police. In the National Violent Development in uh, 19 different fields to be produced by him. Uh, those data include various sections such as how to collect and evaluate some information, uh, estimating disaster effects and impacts, and uh, recovery strategies and needs that have been prepared based on the state of the art knowledge in this field. Uh, Dr. Kambad Amin Hussein is an uh, associate professor and director of East Management Research Center of International Institute of Earthquake Engineering and Seismology, IIES. He has published more than 100 books, scholarly research papers, and technical reports. He is now working in different areas of DRM focusing on earthquake risk. Then, uh, in the second module, <coughs> Uh, disaster risk assessment and its application on catastrophic insurance, which lecture by uh, Dr. Huma Mutamet from AES. Uh, in this section, we focus on uh, uh, the module starts with an introduction to risk management framework and its <clears throat> two main components of risk assessment and risk treatment. Then more information is provided on natural hazard risk model development procedures and component, uh, namely hazard, vulnerability, exposure, and financial calculation. Following that, the application of disaster <coughs> risk model and disaster risk management with a focus on disaster risk transfer is described. 
دکتر هومن معتمد the lecture after second one is a disaster risk specialist with more than eight years of experience in multi-hazard and multi-level catastrophic risk assessment and disaster risk financing. Currently, Human is assistant professor in the research system for risk management at the International Institute of Earthquake Engineering and Seismology IAS, where he managed research projects in the areas of <coughs> DRM, DRR, and disaster insurance. At the end of the session, uh, uh, we will have a question and answer and discussion by Professor Alexander Fekete and Master Mukhattas. Uh, Dr. <clears throat> Alexander Fekete is Professor of Risk and Crisis Management at Thea Kuhn University of Applied Science in Cologne, Germany. His research includes disaster risk management, social vulnerability and resilience, critical infrastructure and civil protection. He is involved with Iranian-German cooperation projects since 2002, currently with Nadima and the Increase project. Also, uh, in our discussion panel, uh, Mahsa Mugaddas, as a PhD candidate at the University of Bonn, Mahsa has an educational background in urban planning and environmental management and has experience in situation, urban development, and urban disaster resilience through her work in consulting companies and research institute in Iran and Germany. Currently, she involved in the Iranian-German cooperation project increase two. Uh, the, all participants can write their question in the public chat. The only uh, way to send us your question and at the end, uh, if we have uh, many questions, we have to choose some of them. Sorry for this, because of the time limitation. Uh, at the first, uh, now we listen to the uh, speaker of the first module, Dr. Amini, uh, please. Uh, I, I, I said to uh, only uh, 20 or 25 minutes. Thank you, Dr. Amini. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Shahwar. Mm -hmm. Hello, everybody. Uh, so as uh, mentioned by Mohammed, my, the title of my presentation is about uh, post-disaster needs assessment of PDNA in Iran. Uh, basically, most of you knows that Iran is prone to different types of the uh, natural hazards, including earthquake, floods, land subsidence, and landslides. And uh, during its history, a lot of disaster happened in the country. So uh, in almost all of these events, uh, the evaluation of the impacts and effects of the disaster were something, some, something uh, some ch had some challenges because uh, there were no uh, uniform, uniform and also a standard uh, approach for assessment of the uh, effects and impacts of the disasters. And this caused some difficulties as well for budget allocation for recursion and recovery because the government needs to know the exact numbers to allocate sufficient numbers. And in many cases, because the data is not appropriate, um, local government exaggerate the damages some, in many cases to get more, um, much more uh, funds from the, local, the national government. And because of that, normally the national government um, uh, only uh, allocate some uh, some parts of the requested amounts of the uh, budgets, so it always caused some difficulties for recovery and uh, reconstructions. Uh, of course, this is not only the uh, problem in Iran. In many other countries, even in the developed countries, we have the similar situation. So that's why uh, the United Nations, along with the World Bank and the European Union. Uh, from 2008 started to prepare some um, guidelines for uh, preparing uh, to for prepared some guidelines for estimating the impacts of the disaster to be used by the government for budget allocations and in um, 2015 the these guidelines were approved and launched in the uh, Sendai World Conference of Disaster Risk Management disaster risk reduction and after that in few countries, as shown in this map, this procedure uh, 
were applied. So in total, uh, the PDNA says that uh, we need to have assessment about all impacts of the disaster in all areas and all the fields. And after that, we need to evaluate the damages, loss, and impacts of the disaster, as well as macroeconomic and human development. <laughs> and based on that, the government can allocate money and mobilize resources for recovery procedures. Uh, if I want to uh, give some uh, picture about the time frames of PDNA, in this chart you see that after the disaster, we have a short period of the time for the emergency response. And soon after, the PDNA will start. And it takes, for example, for about four to six weeks. And uh, so it sh should cover all the areas, so it is not in-depth assessment. This is just shows the general picture of the damages, loss, and impacts, so that the government can decide about the reconstruction plan and allocate in sufficient money. Uh, as mentioned, this procedure uh, should took only uh, should, should take only four to six weeks. For in the first week, the team that are working on PDNA should gather the relevant information and data about the affected areas, and uh, these tables should be prepared in advance so that just they collect them to uh, to compare the. Um, result of field survey with the baseline information. After that, the different teams will be organized and evaluate the damages and loss in the affected areas. It maybe takes one or two weeks. And after that, the analysis will be done in the office. And finally, the report on the PDNA will be published and delivered to the government. Uh, as I mentioned, all the issues that can be affected by disaster should be evaluated in PDNA procedures. In the standard form, we have about 19 sectors in productive social and infrastructure, as well as cross-cutting uh, sectors. For example, in productive sector, we need to evaluate the damage and loss to agriculture sector, commerce sector, industry, tourism, in social group, we need to evaluate the impacts on housing, education, health, and culture. In infrastructure, we need to evaluate the water and sanitation, community infrastructure, energy transport, and telecommunication. In cross-cutting, there are some uh, subjects that uh, have impacts on all of the above mentioned sectors. For example, gender, uh, governance, environment, disaster risk reduction, and employment and livelihood. Uh, should be evaluated for, for all of these items and then uh, the, the necessary um, procedure should be done accordingly. Uh, for the first time in Iran, the PDNA were applied in uh, 2019 floods. Maybe most of you knows that in that event, uh, about 25 provinces in the country have been affected by the flood. In this map, you see that the whole picture of the affected areas by the floods, and only in the white province, white provinces, we didn't had um, flood at that time. And in the uh, blue uh, color uh, provinces, as about six or seven provinces, we had the most affected or ser most serious um, damages in uh, based by the caused by the floods. Uh, in the PDNA procedure, uh, we, uh, we evaluated the condition for, for the Golestan province that is here, Lorestan and Khuzestan, that were mostly affected by the flood. And this was done because of the request from the Plan and Budget Organization of Iran, the United Nations, and um, at different agencies of UN, as well as some uh, local institutions. Uh, started to work on PDNA and uh, it was done in August 2019. Uh, in the PDNA, the, after that flood, uh, about uh, 13 sectors were considered at the first stage, but finally the health sector were not prepared because of some difficulties that they encountered. For each sector, 
the local agencies uh, started to prepare and collect the data for pre I was involved in six of these sectors and also finally uh, we compiled all the reports about this project. The procedure started from the evaluation of the existing information and, uh, called baseline information, <laughs> including social, economic, and cultural status. And after that, we evaluated the disaster effects uh, by uh, gathering information about the affected provinces and counties, and then evaluate the damages and loss. And after that, we evaluated the economic and social impacts. And based on that, we uh, proposed some uh, uh, tables to the government to allocate a budget for recovery and reconstruction. In this uh, table, you see that the evaluation, the result of the evaluation of damage and loss and total effect of the total effect, including damage and loss in the selected provinces. And in this graph, you see the contribution of each sector amongst the total loss and damages. So you, it is clear that agriculture and housing had the most uh, uh, experience, most damages and losses after because of this flood. So after uh, finalizing and the data and preparing and evaluating the data and preparing the report it was published through a report that is accessible in this uh, address you can download the full whole report through this address and uh, you can see what what happened in that project so uh, but during this project it was clear that uh, the standard procedure that was proposed by the uh, UN and EU was not sufficient for local condition in Iran because there were many uh, infrastructures or infrastructures or assets that we have in Iran but they were not considered in the gu international guidelines and there were something in the international guidelines that there were no uh, meaning in Iran. So uh, there were some gaps for uh, evaluation of the damage and, and loss after this earthquake by using after that flood by, by using the, these uh, guidelines. And also the integration method uh, for, uh, for evaluating the total damage and loss was different from the procedure that the UN is followed in that, that guidelines. And in addition, uh, uh, we need to have some, um, uh, we need to use our own procedure for estimating the damage and loss. So uh, after that, the plan and budget organization requested the UN to, uh, to make uh, an, some national guidelines for PDNA for ERA. And IIS was selected as the consultant for preparing that guidelines for ERA. Uh, in that procedure, we uh, evaluated the existing literature about the PDNA. Of course, it was not too much because, as I mentioned, it is very new in the world. And um, few countries had some guidelines, and we uh, tried to collect all of them and evaluate them and try to make some uh, uh, necessary changes on these gu guidelines to have our own guidelines. So finally, the guidelines that we prepared for Iran were uh, prepared through the different groups and sectors. These are the, the guidelines that we prepared for the social sectors. One is related to housing, the other one is related to education, the other one is related to health, and the other one is related to culture. And then uh, in the productive sector, again, we had ag agriculture, uh, commerce, tourism and manufacturing guidelines. And for um, infrastructure, we had water and sanitation and health sector, community infrastructures, telecommunications, transportations, and energy. And for uh, cross-cutting sectors that cover all of the previous mentioned uh, sectors, we had disaster risk reduction, livelihoods, environment, gender, governance, and macroeconomy. So in all 19 um, guidelines were prepared and uh, delivered to 
a PBO for uh, using in the future events. Uh, it is maybe interesting to see to know that uh, yesterday we had a ceremony at IIS and then a for the demonstration of these guidelines and officially deliver them to the government. In each guidelines, we have some uh, different sections. At the first part, we need to have the baseline information. Baseline information is important for us because it shows the existing condition and the assets that we had in uh, different sectors. In many cases in Iran, after the disaster, maybe some reports comes from the local government that uh, the requests are much higher than the uh, uh, existing uh, resources that they had before the events. So um, based on these guidelines, first we need to develop some uh, baseline information tables and uh, according to that, then we can evaluate the damages and losses. For example, this is related to one group in the manufacturing sector. It includes, for example, building infrastructures, facilities. It shows the values, insurance rate, and those who work in these places. And at the end, for example, in the education sector, we can evaluate the total value of the assets and the insurance coverage and the total people that are working in these places. In the next part, we need to evaluate the effects and impacts of the disasters. At the first stage, we, need, we have provided some um, uh, guidelines to, uh, to show how we should collect information about the disaster characteristics, its impacts, dimensions, popu population affected by the disasters, and many other issues that need to be collected as the uh, general information about the disaster. After that, we need to collect information about damage. Normally, uh, for, uh, the damages are um, easily formulated in Iran because this is a very uh, routine works in, by the government. And after each disaster, some teams and groups will evaluate the physical impacts of the disaster on different structures or infrastructures. But uh, in this, in the PDNA, we have organized these, uh, the different elements that should be considered in the PDNA through different tables. And the other part is related to losses. Uh, this is what we didn't have before in Iran, because loss is not the direct damage. For example, if we have a factory in one place that has not been affected by an earthquake or by, the, by flood, but maybe the production is failed because of the uh, uh, changes in supply chain, or maybe because of the damage to the road network, or maybe because of the unavailable raw materials. So the factory itself didn't affect it by the earthquake, but the production is affected for some years. So this is actually the loss of that event. So in evaluation of the loss, we need to evaluate the production reduction or termination or interruption in selling products. Again, for example, if a city or a village have been affected by a disaster, maybe the request for purchasing the products it will be reduced and many uh, available uh, goods and material will be spoiled because there is no customer for using them. So this is considered again as loss. And also the production cost may be increased more. Again, for example, because of the electricity uh, stop in an affected area, maybe the production will be reduced and the local owner maybe use the generators for power generator for um, uh, having electricity. And this cause extra uh, costs for them. And many other things is that is listed in the table that some of them are shown here. I will pass them because of the shortage of the time. And finally, we have a table showing that the total damage that is uh, at the time of the disaster and loss. You see that loss is not only related to the uh, year of occurrence of the disaster, and it may take for some years after. For example, for the production of a factory, it may last for some years to the factory it can reach to the uh, aerial stage before the disaster. The other issue that was new again was related to economic and social impact of natural disasters. This is working basically on the 
uh, macroeconomic impacts. For example, uh, if the production of the petroleum in Iran will be affected by a disaster, it has some impacts on uh, GDP, it has some impacts on export, on import, and many other things that should be considered. And for the social impacts, again, it, it, is, it should be evaluated because the disaster may increase the poverty rate, may be affect the food security, and many other social goals. Again, these items have been listed for each sector. And uh, after that, we need to have the uh, evaluate the uh, uh, recovery and reconstruction um, um, but necessary bu budgets. In this area, uh, we have proposed some uh, strategies that should be considered for the recovery and reconstruction. For example, building back better or securing the sustainable development. We are trying to uh, improve the condition in the affected areas by the disaster. And for this purpose, we need to consider different strategies for allocating the budget. Again, we have different tables for estimating the reconstruction cost that is related to physical aspects of the, mostly physical aspects of the disaster and some recovery needs that is related to uh, organizing the activities again or regenerating the production or many other things that can be listed in this uh, area. And, and at the end, we will provide uh, the needs for the construction and uh, recovery into the different tables for different time period from short term to long term. And the government can understand how much uh, budget should be allocated for this different uh, period of the time. So it helps the government to uh, decide better about the budget allocation. So uh, these tables uh, are prepared and um, um, applied, but uh, as you see that there are many different uh, tables and many different sectors that uh, it is it makes it difficult to uh, make a good estimation about the impacts and effects. We had more than 600 tables that should be applied for different natural disasters from uh, uh, geological disaster or environmental uh, climatological disasters. And at the, each county in Iran, we have 434 counties. So it is quite difficult for filling these uh, tables by hand. So we started to work on developing a web-based application for um, filling these tables and evaluation of that. This uh, application is uh, the first in the world and no other countries up to now have developed, developed such a uh, system. So I have I just show some pictures about this application that is now uh, available. First, the user should enter their national code to have access to the system, and after that, uh, based on the sector, he select uh, the requested one and start to work on that. And each user have some roles. For example, some users have roles for entering the data. Some users have roles for just reading the data. Some of them should analyze the data. And based on the affected area and the selected county and the selected disaster, the different tables that we prepared in the guidelines can be ob uh, observed and filled by the uh, people who is responsible for each sector. So I passed these slides maybe because of the shortage of time. And then if we have time at the end of this discussion, we can go back and talk about these items. So I will finish my presentation. I think this 20 minutes is almost finished and uh, I hope uh, it was useful for you. Thank you so much for your attention. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Amini, for your useful presentation. It was very interesting for me. Uh, also, we have one of the full participants of Nadima panel today. It seems that we have a useful discussion at the end. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Motamet, yes, you can uh, start your presentation at, at the end. We can uh, discuss about two lectures. Thank you. So, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Human Motamet. I'm assistant professor in the international Institute of Earthquake Engineering and Seismology. My um, 
research focus is the disaster risk quantification and assessment, um, as well as the catastrophe insurance. Today, I'm going to share some uh, information about the principles of risk management, its application in disaster risk management, and then how disaster risk assessment could fit uh, the process, um, enabling us to come up with some strategies and actions and measures to manage risk. Um, first of all, um, I will begin with um, some basic information regarding risk, risk management, and then uh, I will uh, talk about disaster risk and um, principles of catastrophe modeling or disaster risk assessment in Iran uh, as a pilot study. Uh, we will uh, take a look at how earthquake could be quantified in terms of losses that it, it may, may bring, uh, bring about in the country and how its results could be applied uh, in the insurance industry to transfer a part of the burden of the loss to other parties and um, another way to manage the disaster risk and then we conclude uh, with the results and achievements of the projects and uh, um, presentation. Okay, um, let's begin with some definition of risk. I'm, I know that you might be quite familiar with the risk, but, uh, but it would be good to uh, have some definition and how other people over time looked at the risk, how they perceived the meaning of, of this word. So in 1977, uh, a definition was provided by Rover, the potential for unwanted negative consequences of an event or activity. And then, uh, like some decades later, the likelihood of something undesirable happening in a given time. And then um, my own uh, definition of risk, which is a measure of loss and its probability. So we are uh, we face two distinct points. First of all, there is something negative in most, most of the time, of course, uh, which is happening and will cause some loss and damages to us. And this occurrence of loss has a probability attachment to it. So two uh, notions together. And then we have risk management, uh, which is defined by the Risk management standard ISO 31000, uh, coordinated activities to direct and control an organization or a system or a country with regard to risk, and also the UNDRR definition of disaster risk management, uh, which is application of risk reduction policies and strategies to prevent new risk, reduce existing risk, and manage residual risk. So with, with this definition, um, uh, luckily we have now a standard that we, we could use to manage all types of risk. It's it's um, it's easy in, in in principle, but maybe harder when it is to be implemented. So a three main uh, part and the stages of that: setting the scope, context, and criteria, assessing the risk, knowing what type of hazard and risk we are facing with, uh, how is the size of it, its uh, probability, its consequences, and then we will figure out what to do with this type of uh, threat uh, to our property and uh, belongings. So three main um, the stages that needs to be uh, followed in order to enable us to manage the risk. Of course, there are other um, other stages with, with, with are some uh, not related to one, but also uh, in, in a general way connecting all parts. Um, over this process, we need to 
on in in different occasions to see if still the results of risk assessment um, are the same. Uh, does the options we have on the table is still effective, or we need to change them looking for something better and more effective? Um, they also need to communicate the risk results with different stakeholders uh, of the project, of, of the company, of the system, of the city, and of the country, uh, in order to keep everyone abreast of the new findings and the type of activities need to be carried out to manage the risk. And, and while doing this, we need to record and report everything in order to uh, uh, have the information in order in enabling us to, to check what has happened in, in past, what we have done to uh, overcome the challenges and what has been the result. So uh, yes, and this is the entirety. So we need to have all these parts and particles together in order to have a um, sort of uh, effective risk management process. Um, also, um, when we assess the risk, we get information about the, the quantity of the threat, the loss, and its probability. We need to take an action. This action could be in different types at different time intervals before the occurrence uh, of the event or disaster after that. And as, as you can see, in a very beautiful uh, categorization of risk treatment actions provided by Dr. Alan Ponter, uh, we have a variety of measures here. So we can either retain the risk or we can transfer it and then retaining that we can reduce the size of risk, or we can pay for the losses, pay for the damages in order to fix them and uh, get it back to its original state. And uh, if we transfer the risk, we could use a uh, different instrument, insurance included, reinsurance, of course, and also other uh, financial instruments that could be very helpful to transfer the risk to a third party in order to uh, minimize the impact of it on the stakeholders. Um, well, um, we, know, we know we had a small uh, summary on the risk and risk management, but one of the main risks that we face, um, especially on, in our profession, is disaster risks. Um, uh, let me tell you a very quick story. Um, before the European co colonies uh, landed in Australia, everyone thought that the only color that swans, this beautiful bird, could have is white. But uh, after that, some black species were found, which was surprising to many people at that time. Um, Based on a very famous definition, disasters are like black swans. They are very rare, but they happen. And when they happen, they have very high severity. They could have a gigantic impact on the society. They could destroy livelihoods, lives of, of people, infrastructures, housing, and uh, um, and uh, leading the, the government with uh, lots of financial problems. So as you can see in this diagram, um, well, events might be of, of small sizes for a long time, uh, long enough that most, of, most people and most um, experts, even experts, could uh, think that nothing important, nothing harsh will happen because it has been like this and it will stay and remain like this. But as soon as uh, they, uh, they, they think that uh, something gigantic, something impressive with huge losses happens and surprise everyone, and this is the 
uh, sort of uh, property and characteristic of disaster losses, uh, as I uh, uh, as I said, of low probability and high severity. Um, Swiss Re, it's um, yearly journal. Uh, Sigma has provided some statistics on the uh, size of losses in terms of USD over years, starting from 1991 uh, till now. And as you can see, the number, the green dots, green circles, as well as the size of disasters, national hazards are, are growing uh, steadily. So, and this has its reasons and causes because uh, cities are growing you know, with an uncontrolled urbanization. There are a huge migration from rural areas to urban cities, and these people usually uh, are accommodated in the vicinity uh, of the cities with poor conditions of housing, with high vulnerability to, to hazard, natural hazards, and also uh, poverty um, will... Uh, well, Oh, sorry. Poverty will increase the uh, size and possibility probability of these uh, events. Um, and uh, well, we, we saw the pattern of, of disasters um, across the world, but Iran is no exception. Uh, the urban population has hugely increased from 1976 to 2020 has been doubled and uh, construction as added zones is still quite common. Uh, we have construction codes, but there's a huge gap between regulations and the real practice. Um, disaster management is still focused on emergency response. This is a common problem everywhere, including Iran, and uh, public awareness uh, towards natural hazards is still low. People have other concerns, and the uh, risk profile of the country is high. But uh, there are other promising regulations, uh, such as the DRM law of 2019 and NATCAPUL uh, law of 2020. Um, okay, the country has experienced destructive events, including Tabas. Ethric, Manjil, Bam, and most recently the widespread floods of 2019, uh, which Dr. Amini described uh, how the government succeeded to uh, quantify and collect the loss and damage data on that event. And uh, all these catastrophes and disasters have happened in small urban areas, mainly in rural areas, but if um, major earthquake happens in, in, in a, a main city, a capital city like Tehran, the size of the losses would be much higher. Uh, so uh, in order to contribute to the uh, effectiveness of disaster risk management in the country, the uh, International Institute of Earthquake Engineering and Seismology uh, in a collaboration with the Insurance Research Center of Iran, started the project to quantify uh, the loss and risk of earthquake in Iran in a very fully probabilistic way, and uh, and it was decided that the result of the study will fit the. Uh, uh, needs of the newly established uh, insurance cat of Iran. Um, in what follows, I, I, I will uh, describe the uh, different modules of this uh, this model, and would show you how it could be used in the insurance to um, sort of enhance the risk transfer in the country. So uh, this is the, mm, the, the main skeleton of a catastrophe model or disaster risk model. As you can see, we have uh, four main modules here, hazard module, exposure, vulnerability, and risk. Um, 
in order to uh, come up with probabilistic results, we need to develop each and every of these components and then combine them using a uh, Monte Carlo simulation method in order to bring to it an, a sense of probability and likelihood. So, uh, um, for the hazard module, uh, there was a simulation, uh, sort of Monte Carlo based prob uh, probabilistic seismic hazard analysis, as you can see, uh, numerous uh, scenarios of possible earthquake uh, across the country were modeled, and the uh, uh, PGA uh, of the earthquake on the surface was calculated using the uh, prediction models uh, to have uh, some uh, figures to calculate, you know, loss assessments. And then after um, all this calculation and uh, uh, more than 500,000 of simulation of possible earthquakes in Iran, these are the results that you can see two earthquakes on the left uh, of a 100-year return period and another one with 475 year uh, return period. As you can see, the level of uh, seismic hazard is much higher when the return period uh, increases. The uh, hazard zones are mainly focused on the Alberts uh, seismic zone as well as Zagros and uh, central Iran. They have also some uh, uh, serious activities and hazard level in the Macron uh, uh, region neighboring the Sea of Amman. Um, and then um, after we develop the hazard module, we need to have an exposure module, which uh, indeed uh, describe how the buildings are distributed in the country and uh, also uh, provides information on the value of this uh, concentration of buildings. So as, as you can see, in terms of steel uh, buildings, the concentration of the buildings are uh, mainly in around main capital cities uh, of Tehran, Esfahan, Tabriz, Mashhad, and Shiraz. And uh, these map shows the distribution, spatial distribution of masonry buildings as you can see, we have more buildings constructed by masonry materials. These type of materials are essentially more vulnerable to earthquake. And uh, um, if I'm not wrong, uh, about uh, half of the building in the country has been constructed using masonry materials. Um, and um, after uh, developing hazard and exposure, we need to have some graphs showing how the level of hazard, of seismic hazard, could relate to the rate and percentage of loss uh, for different types of uh, buildings. Um, here, as you can see, we have six different types, masonry, reinforced concrete, steel, adobe, others, and some unknown constructions. Uh, the methods, uh, mainly analytical, empirical, and hybrid ones, could be used to develop these curves. Uh, we have uh, followed a hybrid methodology, which means uh, first we uh, develop some analytical uh, curves using uh, computer programs, and then we fix the curves to the loss data, historical loss data we had, uh, which, was, which were collected in, in past earthquakes in Iran. So now um, we have our three modules of hazard exposure and vulnerability ready. We can combine them to calculate loss or uh, risk here. Here we can see one of the risk parameters, which is average annual loss, which shows uh, how on an average, over a very long period of time, a yearly loss would uh, look like. So uh, um, on the uh, 
map to the left, you can see the average annual loss of uh, steel structures. As you could uh, might recall, we had uh, concentration of buildings around Tehran and Isfahan, Tabriz, Mashhad, and, and Shiraz, and it is uh, reasonable that uh, we see more losses in, the, in, in these areas as well. And um, on the right, we can see the average loss uh, of the masonry buildings. You can see the level of losses, the size of losses is higher than uh, steel structures because of the uh, lower, higher vulnerability of uh, these type of structures compared to the steel structures. Uh, okay, so far we have assessed uh, in a probabilistic way the uh, distribution of loss to the residential buildings uh, in Iran. So now it's time to use this assessment and find some treatment, disaster risk treatment, to uh, sort of manage the earthquake risk in Iran. We have uh, three types of uh, disaster risks here, disaster risk treatment here. Uh, either we can avoid the risk, this is uh, mainly used when we can plan for land uses, we allocate uh, the lands with higher level of hazard to, to the uh, uses uh, having less concentration of population like parks and green areas and safe lands uh, to the uh, uses of uh, with more concentration of people, for, for example, with high-rise building. And uh, through this strategy, we could avoid being uh, faced with uh, hazards and uh, reduce managed risk. The other um, uh, measure would be the reduction. Then we are inevitably faced with uh, disaster risk and we could not avoid and run away from that we need to uh, strengthen of ourselves. We do that by retrofitting buildings, taking more strict construction codes. Um, uh, in terms of fire, for example, hazard, we install water sprinkles that in case the fire happens, the sprinkles ex extinguish the fire and reduce the risk and um, of course after doing of all of these items there are still some risk remaining for the residual risk we can transfer the risk or pay for that uh, there are different instruments insurance is the most famous one that uh, could redistribute the loss to a larger uh, size of societies to other even to other countries through reinsurance uh, mechanism and reduce the burden, uh, the financial burden of disasters. Um, disaster risk treatment also can be uh, shown in terms of type, timing. I'm sure you're all uh, familiar with type of with this type of diagrams. So uh, no additional uh, description is necessary here. And and this is the uh, application. Uh, one one, one uh, type of application of the uh, earthquake risk study that we uh, conducted in Iran. The uh, outcome of the study has been converted to the insurance uh, premium ra risks. This is, this is the uh, ratio that uh, your payment to the insurance company is calculated with. So, uh, as you can see, uh, the, the premium is higher for buildings with uh, higher vulnerability. For example, Adobe, uh, you can see here that the, the rates are higher than the steel and RC. And uh, also, there are a combination of um, uh, uh, ways that uh, the insured could pay, for example, uh, we can put a limitation on the coverage of the policy. We can do a deduction for that, and uh, using this combination, we can we can make the insurance policy more affordable to to uh, different layers of uh, society. Um, 
yes, you can see here that uh, using these terms and conditions, we could lower the uh, premium here and make it more affordable. And also, this is a map for the risk, earthquake risk profile of Iran. You can see uh, the household in which counties in Iran should pay more for their insurance because they have more vulnerable uh, buildings and their, their buildings are located in higher hazard, seismic hazard areas. Uh, West Azerbaijan and uh, Yaz uh, are among uh, these uh, counties that need to pay more for their uh, insurance. Um, yeah. Yes, and in conclusion, um, a systematic approach can always help us to manage risk. We need to uh, follow those stages to come up with uh, desirable results. Disaster risks are growing across the globe, including Iran. So uh, measures should, should be taken to manage them. Catastrophe risk modeling or disaster risk assessment is a sophisticated method that could be used to quantify disaster risk. And that could fit the catastrophe insurance uh, as a risk transfer instrument. Um, Iran building catastrophe insurance pool and it benefits from the results of earthquake risk that we just in the study that we conducted. And uh, they are preparing their coverage for the entire nation using the rates that we have come up with. Thank you very much um, for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Mutad, for your interesting lecture on various risks in Iran. Uh, now I invited uh, Professor Fekete and Dr. Mogadas uh, to provide participants and speakers with any challenges or suggestions in Dubai. Uh, also, I would be thankful if Dr. Amini uh, answered the first uh, question and uh, if there is any question in Persian or English, uh, I would be very happy. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to congratulate both speakers for the excellent presentations. I think it was very interesting to learn how you try to apply to the TDMA approach that was available only for a few countries, and you've shown the efforts you have taken to cover a very great number of sectors. Um, it's very impressive. Now, there's also an international call for more of those loss and damage assessments, especially during the climate change negotiations. Some people, and especially countries, have formed a consortium, the V20, it's the vulnerable 20 countries. And they want to find arguments that indeed climate change does affect them. So I can imagine that also other countries would be very interested in your methodology and the experiences you have made, Dr. Amini. Would you think it is an idea to share that knowledge by creating a toolbox where different methods can be combined and where also maybe some new methods and ideas from your experience could be shared? Or how do you think that uh, a PDNA can be shared best? Because the guidelines, the printed ones by the United Nations are out there but they're not very detailed as far as I know them. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, your voice was not very clear, so I tried to address then uh, what was your uh, comment. But basically, uh, the guidelines that we prepared were based, basically based on the uh, UN guidelines, but we have adapted it based on the local condition in Iran. Uh, for uh, calculating the damage and loss, we use and, and try to apply the system that we have in Iran. So this is for each country, if you, for example, if you, if you want to use it for other countries such as Germany, you need to adapt it based on your local condition. Basically, you have your own system for uh, assessment. But the whole picture and the framework of the guidelines uh, can be duplicated in everywhere. And, as, and, and the PDNA software also uh, can be uh, used in different countries as well, because again, uh, different modules that we have in the PDNA software can be replaced based on the uh, 
uh, condition that we have in different countries. So in total, we believe that this was a very big step toward, but still there are some gaps. For example, uh, quantifying the losses and impact is quite difficult, especially when we talk about the economic impacts or social impacts. In the PDNA report that we prepared for the first time for Iran, uh, it was a challenge for us. That's why the, in the figures, the total loss is much lower than the damage. But in, uh, in reality, I, I myself believe that loss should be more than the damage because it continues for several years. If I, have, if I want to make an example, uh, I can uh, say the BAM case. In BAM case, the tourism was completely destroyed for 10 years. For example, the manufacturing in the industrial city of BAM was uh, affected for some couple of the years. Uh, but nobody uh, quantified the losses in, after that event. So that's why we have the figure that we have for the damage in BAM case are changing from 5 million US dollars to 5 billion US dollars. Uh, I believe that uh, PDNA can provide a platform for uh, quantifying these types of the uh, uh, damage, loss, and impacts. However, it is quite difficult to understand the real figures because uh, in many cases, as you know, uh, quantifying the, these types of the information is quite difficult. I hope I could answer your question because it was not clear. <laughs> Thank you very much and sorry for the problem with the voice. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much, um, Dr. Amini, for your presentation, and Dr. Motamed, um, thank you as well. And let me first congratulate you for a, such great achievement on uh, delivering uh, PDNA reports based on um, Iran needs. Um, well, in terms of uh, climate change and facing more frequent uh, unpredictable disasters, and shocks, um, um, I believe that such um, actually assessments, PDNA, uh, and development of um, a roadmap for recovery based on the principle of building back better is very important. And uh, one of uh, the important tasks that uh, based on your uh, presentation, I uh, realized is like, this is a mechanism that can bring all the stakeholders at national and international level together and align their efforts to support recovery and mobilize their resources uh, efficiently. So in this regard, I have two questions for you, Dr. Amini, first. Um, the first is about um, uh, social aspects. Uh, I believe that uh, from bottom of perspective, um, somehow there are many actors and volunteers uh, with different skills contributing to post-disaster recovery. And uh, I just wanted to know uh, what is your idea about uh, the role of uh, community-based organizations and NGOs and how they can contribute to PDNA. And the second question is about technical aspects uh, regarding the uh, you know, technological advances such as machine learning, AI, or digital twins, for instance. Uh, and as well as, you know, the emergence of uh, new data sources such as crowdsourced data um, and satellite imagery, of course, uh, how, um, to what extent um, such uh, technical advancement uh, is adopted in, in your approach? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mahsa. Uh, yeah. Um... The social aspects is considered in PDNA, but we should consider that uh, PDNA is, is a tool for the government to allocate a budget for recovery and construction. In the assessment of the impact, one part is related to social impacts that is mostly related to um, poverty rate and also the uh, security nutrition. So uh, in this case, those who are preparing the PDN in each sector should have some estimation about the impacts of that disaster on that sector, on the poverty rate, or for example, other social aspects in the specific community that have been affected. And in the recovery uh, uh, procedure, if you uh, had a look on the, maybe later you can have a look on the tables of the recovery, there are some uh, parts that, uh, the government should allocate budget for uh, strengthening the co communities. 
So if some community have been affected by the disaster, the, the government should provide some assistance to them to come back to their earlier conditions. But for gathering data, it, it, it is possible to use the community-based organizations because as you mentioned, in, in some different parts of the country, we have the such types of associations and we can use their capacity for collecting data. At this moment, this is not considering this uh, project because the scale is at county level. In the next step, based on the agreement that we had with the Ministry of Interior, we, are, we want to uh, narrow down this, uh, this uh, picture to the parcels and units and even blocks. So in this case, we can consider some rules for the communities. And um, for sure, they, they are available in different areas and they can uh, rapidly uh, gather information and transfer it to the upper level in their community and their county or their city. So this is in our next step, but at this moment it is not considered, this is what we've just want, we just consider the uh, needs of the communities, not their assistance to gather information. Uh, but in next step for sure it should be considered. Regarding your second question, uh, again in the next step of the, this project we want to uh, use the GIS applications for data gathering and also the, uh, compiling the data. At this moment, there are only some flat tables. The local authorities uh, in different sectors, um, different ministries or different organizations should go through their own table and fill it based on the information that they collected through the site visit and field survey. But uh, the next step, uh, we want to uh, develop some uh, mobile applications that if somebody goes to somewhere that have been affected by disaster, uh, they can collect and record the data online and mentioning the location and the types of damage and the estimation about the damage and send it to the uh, database of the system. Uh, this is possible and the system that we have developed have this capacity, but again, uh, it takes time. Maybe uh, in the next step we are we should work on this aspect as well. But both com comments are important and we have something in our mind to do it uh, in future. Thank you. Sounds amazing, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, can I ask one more question? Sure. I'm sorry, my apologies that my microphone voice was low. I hope it's now better. Mm -hmm. A bit better. <laughs> so I'd like to ask a question about insurance also. Insurance is of interest in many parts of the world and uh, there are many countries who have not uh, insurance cover so widely yet. And also sometimes disasters are very costly, very expensive and it's not possible to compensate all damages, for example on bridges that are typically very costly or road infrastructure. Are there methods already to prioritize such uh, items, such as bridges, and to allocate dedicated insurance coverage only to these? There are certain cap bonds, I'm aware, that try to make this, but they also try to have some trouble because the communities who are affected often do not understand if they don't get any money back from the insurance because their bridge or their building was not prioritized very high. So are there any methods already with the damage curves or vulnerability curves to separate the more important to lesser important assets? Oh, well, I assume I, um, I need to answer this. Um, well, um, this is a very common problem, especially for the community. Um, um, there are different communities, um, generally with lower level of income, that uh, are being affected the most during the disasters and the coverage of insurance policies uh, will not suffice their needs. So uh, what other countries, um, as, best practice, as best practice, have done uh, is uh, establishing regional catastrophe pools and then uh, designing different insurance 
products that uh, uh, provide the financial aid to the target uh, properties, as, as you mentioned. So, for example, um, a, sovereign a sovereign insurance pool could provide uh, funds to, after a disaster, occurrence of a disaster for government in order to uh, rebuild and reconstruct the infrastructures of the country. That the, those type of assets that are usually not covered by uh, um, ordinary insurance policies. So um, I think uh, um, the insurance industry need to be more innovative in terms of designing policies that uh, at, at one and on one hand uh, provide necessary funds to the um, to the uh, high priority uh, losses and on the other hand through the uh, collaboration of uh, community uh, groups and, and NGOs to uh, uh, inform people how these innovative products work and uh, in, in, which, in which cases they should expect uh, payments from those policies. So it's a it's a sort of both way uh, um, um, situation in which both the community need to be uh, educated uh, and also a better policy and insurance products need to be designed that uh, accommodate those special needs of, of the country. Thank you. Um, well, I also have a question uh, for you, Dr. Motamet. Uh, so we know that um, you already also mentioned it, that to manage risk, um, increasing preparedness capacity is a must. And we know that for many people thinking ahead of a disaster is unlikely because they have no experience with it uh, in most cases, the black swan phenomenon that you explained. Um, I would like to know um, your general um, opinion about the strategies that can be enforced to uh, improve or encourage public risk awareness and, um, you know, mitigation uh, that can result in or leading to increasing market penetration of risk insurance. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, actually, that's that's the situation and challenge uh, Iran is facing at the moment. So, because of the uh, low level of risk perception, there is uh, uh, not sufficient demand for insurance uh, policies, and uh, this produces some problems in in face of disasters in Iran. So. Um, as, as the, uh, we have discussed this, this problem with other colleagues at uh, different times in different places, the output of such discussions would be uh, a combination of both a uh, uh, bottom-up and top-down approaches at, 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 the, at the same time. So we need to um, um, take actions in the government for the layers that having the power and also at the bottom, yeah, by the help of NGOs to educate people. But um, yeah, th th I think that would be the most effective approach to do that because otherwise, uh, as we experienced in, in past years, uh, one approach solely could not be sufficiently effective. Yeah, yeah, in a nutshell. Yeah. Absolutely, thank you. Dr. Mohamed, uh, I have a question for you. Uh, uh, it's about uh, risk assessment or even in insurance. Uh, can we now evaluate new construction with uh, good accuracy? Uh, I mean, uh, for example, we recently had only one stronger quake in a particular mm -hmm. area, sample is how I mean. Mm -hmm. It would be good performance for newly constructed structure. Mm -hmm. uh, can we now uh, evaluate uh, the risk reduction for our new construction now, or uh, it's not enough? Mm, yeah. 
So, yes, as you, as you can recall, on, on the second day of disaster in the Camoncho earthquake, we both uh, saw each other um, in an unplanned way in the field at the second day of, of the earthquake in 2017. So, uh, I divide the problem into two parts. Um, first, we have uh, construction codes which are seemingly enforced by the government and through the line ministries, which uh, monitors the quality of construction in the country. Um, and uh, second, we have the type of construction that we saw that uh, despite the uh, newly construction uh, uh, of the those buildings, they have experienced uh, severe damages uh, because of the gap between the uh, construction standards and the practice on the ground. So the, I see the problem uh, in this way that uh, although we have been quite uh, advanced in terms of writing codes and updating those on an uh, um, sort of uh, 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 in, a, in a disciplined way, meaning that uh, each five years we have a new update of the construction codes. But on the ground, people and builders are, are do what they want, and uh, there's a gap between that. Within that. And that's why uh, we saw that uh, just a newly constructed hospital in the city which was ready, which was considered to be ready to respond to the disasters and uh, admit the people with injuries, was the first victim of the earthquake itself. And uh, I, I can see that through this gap between the practice and, and knowledge. Um, as long as this uh, gap exists, we could not rely on our new constructions. So maybe past a, a better a, a, a data collection of higher quality of the lost data would help us to come up with more reasonable results showing the uh, realistic behavior of the type of construction that we build in the country. Thank you. Um, Professor Fekete or Dr. Mugatas, do you have any uh, more questions? You can go to the question by the participant. Okay, thank you. I think uh, Dr. Amini, uh, there was a question. I think the uh, difference between uh, loss and I think uh, damage. damage. It means the loss and the damage. And the other question, I think, about the tangible and intangible uh, for the flooding uh, 2017, I think. I would be thankful if you answer that. Thank you. Okay. Th thank you, Mohammed. Uh, actually, in PDNA, the definition of damage is that uh, the direct physical uh, damage that uh, a property uh, experienced by a disaster. For example, a building will be destroyed and it is a damage because we can estimate the cost of a, a building. But loss is not a physical uh, damage. Loss is related, for example, to a decrease in production. The, as I, I mentioned in my presentation, for example, a factory maybe the, uh, will not, would not be damaged by earthquake or any other disasters. But uh, because of the raw material cannot reach to the factory, the production will be reduced or terminated. This is the loss because uh, there is no uh, earning by, um, by the production by the factory. Or for example, uh, because of the shortage of the electricity, the, owner needs to buy a generator, a power generator, or to uh, find some other ways that have higher prices or higher. Uh, this is again loss. So uh, 
in short, uh, if, you, if I want to say that the damage is physical and very, we can also say it tangible, uh, tangible the damage because it is measurable easily, but loss and impacts are not tangible. So we need to estimate it based on the, uh, our evaluation about the reproductions or coming back to the earlier stages. So it takes some, some years. So if uh, it was enough, maybe uh, you need some more explanation I can provide. Thank you. Is there uh, other question? I think I just searching for the previous question. Dr. Shavad, Dr. Nasser, you had a question about the flood. I'm not sure if we address that question as well. Uh, do you mean the tangible and intangible? Uh... So that was okay. Okay. Maybe if if there is any other question from the participants, please uh, mention it either in the chat or just raise your hand. That would be. Uh, I have a question me from our panelists uh, and uh, uh, the discussant from Germany. Given the fact that uh, basically you discuss this disaster risk management and uh, the project that we are also doing that with Iran is emphasizing on the role of culture. And uh, basically, I would like to know your opinion regarding uh, the uh, the perception regarding the disaster risk in Iran as a country which is ethnic, ethnically very polarized country with different cultural attitudes and preferences. Uh, do you see any basically role uh, from these uh, uh, different uh, cultural attitudes regarding the relevance of disaster, natural disaster risk, uh, also from the uh, religious perspectives, how uh, these uh, type of informal institutions are relevant to design policies with respect to uh, natural disaster risk management in Iran. And maybe also in Germany, maybe I'm not sure if Alexander uh, Masamogadis knows about that, uh, whether these type of um, uh, type of informal institutions are also relevant for regulators and policymakers in designing uh, packages with reference to natural disaster and how the people perceive the disaster risk, uh, including, of course, the, the disaster literacy, uh, which is also important, and how the institutions, IES, is working on these type of topics as well, uh, to take into account these cultural attitudes um, with reference to disaster, natural disasters. Thank you. It was a question from which? <laughs> which uh, well, from both. I mean, uh, maybe uh, um, from the Iranian side, uh, any of you who feel more uh, comfortable with this question and work on the cultural aspects of disaster because uh, I realized that the focus of both presentation was on the disaster risk management. Uh, and I think uh, uh, integrating uh, uh, the cultural attitudes and how the people perceive and understand the natural disaster uh, risk um, and to what extent the religious considerations might influence these perceptions of the people regarding uh, the importance of, for example, using insurance, uh, disaster insurance, or uh, take it as granted so we cannot do anything regarding uh, the act of God and things like this. So um, why we should use, for example, disaster insurance policy and things like this. So how your institutions in Iran basically work also on this type of aspects and take into account the differences, you know, in Iran we are talking about a country which is building on many ethnical groups with different cultural understandings of the things. In Germany, is a more homogeneous country, I suppose, here. Uh, but still, I guess, uh, the differences in different Bundesländer states 
uh, how the people in the north and south and west and east uh, decide in the case of corona pandemic. Uh, how these things, you know, what do you think about these type of factors for policy yeah. making? Uh, actually, at IIES, at least I can explain about it. Uh, we have a department for public education. This is working under the, the uh, Disaster Management Risk Research Center. And uh, in this department, we are preparing some documents to increase the public awareness about the earthquake and the roles of the peoples and the government about different aspects of the disaster management. And also, we organize some national programs. Uh, recently, it is um, before we called it uh, national drills for uh, earthquake safety. Uh, if you remember, in old schools, we had one day a year that we have a national drill uh, for earthquake and safety. But during the five uh, recent five years, we changed this program and called, now it, it is called as safe school resilient communities. It means that each community um, can rely on the safe schools that is located in each community. And it in the school, um, we need to provide the information to the local people. And a community member can come to the school and get necessary information about the disaster risk and what should be done and how to prepare themselves. And at the time of the crisis and time of the disaster, the people can go to the school as an emergency shelter. And some uh, emergency materials, including water and tents and some other things, will be piled in, inside the schools to be used at the time of crisis. So from our side, we believe that there are something is done. But if you want to explain about the whole country and the government attitude, for sure, it is quite difficult. And uh, at the, this moment, there is a, a very low uh, public awareness about the earthquake and the roles of the peoples. Most of the peoples knows the roots of the earthquake, but they believe that this is the role, role of the government and the municipalities to take care of them, not their own roles. And this is the problem because for disaster risk man management, we should rely on the people themselves and then re rely on the government. So this is this needs time, and uh, we are trying our to to change this situation. But uh, you you see the capacity of IIS is really limited, and maybe. It takes many years if you want to do it by ourselves. Thank you very much. Maybe uh, Alexander or Ms. Mogadas, in uh, from your view as people who are working in the type of context of disaster management in Germany, is the role of culture and cultural preferences uh, is a relevant topic in for policymakers, regulators? At the government and how basically you contrast the example of Germany with what we already learned about Iranian context. What do you see? Alex, would you like to? <laughs> um, well, um, of course, um, Dr. Fekete can um, provide more information on that. But um, as Dr. Amini already mentioned, um, how we grew up with the uh, a concept of being uh, so one day being exposed to earthquake in, in Iran. I grew up with this um, in my mind. And uh, I remember when I was at elementary school, um, we had um, some sort of trainings for, uh, for earthquake response, for example, going under our desks. So um, it was, uh, it is nice to hear that this kind of um, uh, programs are improving and uh, resilience school is very nice concept and of course uh, regardless of cultural differences I think education matters and um, education uh, for all uh, not only uh, young people but also elderly people that probably think that earthquake is the act of God uh, so um, now in um, nowadays, uh, the concept of climate change is uh, something that we hear a lot in the media, in news, in uh, at, at work, uh, almost everywhere. And what I saw in Germany, and it was very uh, nice for me to see how 
uh, people, especially uh, younger people, uh, every Friday um, had some sort of, uh, you know, uh, coming to the street, um, bringing brochures like, um, you know, we need to uh, do something for our earth, for our uh, mother earth. And um, we should stop, for example, coal mining in Germany. So these are some sort of, um, uh, you know, actions probably small ones, but very influential that we can see uh, all around. And um, uh, I think um, in general cultural aspect, although it's not in the area of my expertise, I know that uh, has um, uh, uh, important role and can make important role in uh, policy making. And this is something that um, Professor Faraz Anagon, probably you can also give, off, uh, give, uh, give us some hints about it. Alex, over to you, if you want to add something. Well, thank you. Maybe briefly, I think in Germany, religious interests are not so visible on the uh, overall picture of disaster risk management. But there are several rescue and aid organizations like the Johannitas, Maltesers, and others who are traditionally religious organizations. So I think the voluntary the organized voluntary system is very much based on the background, the historical background of those religious groups, just as you might have the Red Crescent Society or Red Cross that you, that you know. <clears throat> Other than that, I think only in operations you see psychological support provided by religious uh, priests and others after an earthquake or we rather have floods in Germany. Now, on the political side, I think, yes, indeed, cultural aspects play a huge role. But it's more like whether you are supporting green energy or something similar and not religious, uh, I think, too much. But I know that um, it is. it can be a very strong uh, factor in uh, separating people's opinions, too. Excellent. Dr. Shahabad, yeah, do, you, yeah. do we have more questions from audience? Yeah. Two question, I think, from uh, for Dr. Amini. The the first one, I just went back. Here. Dr. Nazari, Dr. Nazari has also posted a few more questions regarding the fluid. Maybe uh, he can also uh, use his microphone if it's easier uh, to ask the question. Yeah. If he if he thinks, Dr. Nazari, are you available to ask your question using your audio? Uh, okay. okay, he's not, I mean, he's not taking the microphone. Hello, everybody. Uh, yes. Hello, everybody. Yes. Uh, 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 do you, do you, can you hear my voice? Yes. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity uh, to share and ask my questions. Actually, uh, sorry, because maybe my questions is, is maybe simple, but uh, I, I, in some case I have mixed up. And uh, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Amini, I uh, know that uh, as you said, there are different methods and different resources for estimations of damage, uh, for example, uh, for example, uh, uh, there are different sections, uh, estimations, different uh, value for the damages. As uh, I said, uh, for example, uh, I hear uh, 35,000 uh, billion comments in, uh, uh, for uh, 2,090 <coughs> floods in Iran, but uh, your uh, uh, you post uh, resources and the, the estimations is different. I want to, uh, to have a question. How we can validate between different estimations? Is there any uh, method to validate that the, which method is more accurate in contrast to the other estimations? Uh, uh, I don't know, uh, is it clear or not? Actually, the validations of the estimation method, how we can validate 
the damages and loses that a source, uh, for example, uh, in organizations or uh, sectors, uh, sets uh, in this regard. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, Dr. Nazari. Uh, actually, in PDNA, uh, each sector has one responsible. For example, the sector of agriculture responsible is the Ministry of Ag Ag Agriculture. So that all data should be collected and compiled in the PDNA based on the responsibility of uh, that organization. And they have their own methodology for estimating, for example, the damages. For loss, they don't have uh, maybe at any formulation at, at this moment. For example, they, uh, they can estimate the total size of the farms or the total size of the gardens that have been affected by the um, flood or by the earthquake and can estimate the total um, um, production that have been affected or damaged by the uh, flood. So they will include the data inside the uh, system. Uh, for the other sector as well, the, the their own responsible will include the data and estimate the data and, uh, and will be used their input from their side. Um, for damage, it is easy actually, because for example, when a building is destructed by the earthquake, it is very easily can be estimated, damage can be estimated because we know that the price for making one square meter of each building so you can estimate the total size of the total area of the building that have been damaged. And by considering the value of each square meter, you can estimate the, uh, the total damage. But for a loss, it is different. For example, if one farm have been affected by flood, you can estimate that for two years or three years, you cannot have any uh, production from that farm. And you have some estimation about the previous production of that farm. So we can estimate that for two years, we don't have any production from this farm. And based on the previous data that we had, for example, this amounts of the money because of the production of this farm. So for the loss for two years can be estimated. This is an estimation. Be, there is, uh, I, I think it is not very easily can be validated. To just show you that the total picture is what? But if you need to go through the details, you need to use another approach. In PDNA, we don't go through the details. Just we have a general picture about the damage, loss, and impacts. Because we want to provide some uh, assistance to the government to for make decisions for allocating the budget for reconstruction and recovery. But for in-depth uh, estimation, you need to use another approach. PDNA is not sufficient for these types of the in-depth uh, analysis. I hope I could uh, explain. What you Thank you so much, Dr. Amini and Dr. Farzanagan, for giving time to me. Thank you so much. It's it's uh, okay. You're Very right. good. Yeah. And Dr. Amini, Mrs. Rahimi asked that by given the presence of different stakeholders in reconstruction programs, what is your strategy for preventing potential conflicts? Yeah, actually, again, we should consider different sectors. Maybe this question is related to the housing sector. For example, for uh, reconstruction of housing sector, we have some uh, different agencies, but uh, the main responsibility is belongs to the housing foundation of Iran. So the uh, government will allocate the budget uh, for reconstruction and uh, for to, to these institutions. For the agriculture, the government allocate the budget to the Ministry of Agri Agriculture. So uh, I don't see that uh, there, there are uh, too much conflicts. Maybe at local level the, between the contractor, there are some conflicts, but in a uh, government level, in national level, uh, it is very clear. This budget should be allocated to the, those that are responsible for doing that work. But at local level, maybe there are some types of a conflict between the contractors. This is, not uh, considered in PDNA actually. This is some local issue that we resolved by the local agencies. Yes, thank you. And now I think we can closing the panel. If you agree, Dr. Farzan, even I think we have a good discussion. Yes, excellent. I mean, I thank all of our panelists, uh, Dr. Motamed and Dr. Hosseini, Dr. Fekete and Ms. Mogaddas. 
uh, you yourself, Dr. Shahwar, for organizing and coordinating this excellent panel. I enjoyed it a lot and I learned personally much from your presentation and I hope that participants also benefited from this discussion. Just before ending the panel and uh, uh, I have a general question because uh, it's not directly related to uh, the presentations, but from these institutions which today in this panel are involved uh, from Iran. Uh, one from your site, Dr. Shahbar from Iran Strong Motion Network, which is also working in the field of earthquake uh, and the IAES. How this collaboration with these uh, two institutes in Iran uh, is formed in uh, your institutions, in your system, and how this collaboration is important for natural disaster risk management, how you see um, this institutional collaboration between IAS and Strong Motion Network? This is a political question. <laughs> <laughs> or is, uh, I suppose it should not be a, com a competing institution, but uh, is there any systematic exchange of information between IAS and Strong Motion Network, just for my own information here? Yeah. Actually, uh, I am working in the specific department that uh, don't have much uh, relation with the BHRC, but maybe Dr. Motamed or uh, Dr. Shahwar can, can explain. I, I know that there are some types of the exchange of inf information, but I am not aware about the details. Maybe our friend can explain better than me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I have studied my PhD at IAES. Now I'm working at BHRC. And I think uh, between the Iran Strong Motion and the IAES, we have a very good relation. Uh, I think every year we have uh, lots of master and PhD thesis uh, working with the BHRC data. But I think uh, in the other uh, uh, center, such as, for example, the risk management or other, we can uh, work to have a better relation, I think. But with the ISMN, uh, I can say that we have the best relation now. Okay, excellent. So I hope that this type of collaboration in the Nadimo project also help to uh, basically uh, converge this uh, interest on disaster risk management in Iran. Uh, I have no further comments, uh, Alexander, Ms. Massa, if you have uh, final concluding comments, please feel free uh, before that we conclude the panel for today. Well, if I may start, I think I would like to thank everyone every, very much, especially the participants who are still there and the presenters, because I think it's very important to have a cooperation uh, worldwide in these times, because we have not only climate change, we have pandemics and others. An earthquake is a problem that affects Iran very much, and we have a lot of experience. So I think you're even forerunners globally on knowledge. And we've seen that uh, methods such as PDNA and insurance are just to be developed. They are not available everywhere. So I think it's really key um, value what you're providing, sharing it with, with us. I was, would hope that more participants could come from Germany and be interested, but I think it's also due that in Germany we are fortunate not having earthquakes. So I think the people here misunderstand the importance of it. So just uh, two years ago, the German government has published a report on a risk analysis on the likelihood of an earthquake in our area in Cologne. And it is existing, but people are just not aware of it. So I think we have debated a lot about risk perception also and cultural importance and maybe a lack of awareness to support our work. So this uh, webinar series is very in important to actually raise such awareness in both countries I think in Germany, we're lagging behind Iran a lot. So thanks very much for your availability today. And uh, from my side, um, actually, um, I, I think that disasters bring people together after it happens. And what we need is like getting together before disasters and building collective resilience before we saw or we see the shocks. Uh, that unfortunately are uh, coming more frequently than before. And such collaboration, exchange of knowledge is very valuable and I hope that it continues as it's going now.
Thank you very much from uh, my side, uh, Dr. Amini, Dr. Motame, Dr. Shahbar, and of course, Dr. Farzan Egon and uh, Dr. Fekete for uh, your inputs. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, also, I uh, appreciate the support of uh, my team in Marburg who uh, basically uh, helped to organize this panel and also the coordinators in Iran which uh, did a great job of uh, uh, you know promoting the events in Iran and we had uh, many participants uh, from Iran uh, and I appreciate their participation in this event and as Ms. Muqaddas mentioned we also continue this type of uh, events in the forthcoming months uh, and uh, I hope that by improving the situation of pandemic, we manage also to uh, collaborate uh, in person, physically, in future between the partner institutions in the NADIMO project. So uh, I say goodbye from my side and wish you a very nice afternoon and day uh, everywhere that you are.